Good morning, and welcome to the Orthodox Real Mind. My name is Zan. We are going to be starting our new five-week sermon series called Replant, going over our church's values. And uh, as we do this uh, this morning, as, as we just start uh, in this new season, as we just finished through, uh, gotten through uh, to a new year, uh, as we start this series, I just want to open us up in word of prayer. Father, we thank you so much for the opportunity to be here. God, new year. Um, God, as we go over these, these core values, God, of what we stand for, um, God, I pray that your spirit is already going before us, God, to just have our hearts open, Lord, and just our minds open to receive it. Um, God, as we enter this new season, God, this new year, uh, may our hearts be so in tune with you, God, that we want more of you and less of ourselves. God, we love you and we thank you. That's in Jesus' name. Amen. Have you ever felt like a replant? Uh, I was thinking about it the other day. Uh, I have moved eight times in my life, and that may not be a lot to some of you. That may be a lot to others, but but every time that I moved, I, I felt like a replant. I, I had to make new friends at school, or I had to discover what this new job was going to be like and, while trying to navigate other changes in life as well. You see, the thing about replanting in life is that it doesn't just have to be a physical move. It can be emotional, spiritual, or even situational. Uh, Like if you've ever gone through a breakup, or gotten married, or had a kid, or started a new job. Every single one of those situations in life are life-altering events that can make us feel like we've been replanted. Each one of those moments are challenging, and they make us ask the question, okay, In light of all of this, who am I, really? You see, we we named this new series that we're going to begin today called Replant because it feels like that's where we are in this post-COVID world. We've corporately, and some of us personally, have been through life-altering seasons that have made us ask the question, okay, who are we? And we get, when we get in those moments, we, we need something to hold on to. We need anchor points that will allow us to come back to the center of who we are called to be. Good morning. My name is Joey Bates. I'm one of the pastors here at The Orchard, and I'm, we're so glad that you're tuning in today as we begin a new series called Replant. During the series, we're going to be looking at the core values of our church and how they should be core values in our own personal lives as well. These core values are our anchor points and the replanting moments of our life. Where we're talking about anchor points to hold on to when life gets shaky, when, when life feels uh, unclear. These are places that we can always come back to. These are values that will will always recenter us into who God is calling us to be. And these values will always see us through. Now, the first thing we're going to talk about in this series is having a high view of Christ and a high view of Scripture. Now, those are our first two values. And And I realize that we could spend an entire sermon series on both of those, but but they are inseparable of themselves. If you have a high view of Jesus, then you're going to have a high view of Scripture because Jesus had a high view of Scripture. And if you have a high view of Scripture, then you're going to have a high view of Jesus because Scripture has a high view of Jesus. You see, the Bible is full of these things called Christologies, and I know that's a fancy word, but basically what a Christology means, it is a, it is a situation or a passage of Scripture that tells us about the person, nature, and role of of Jesus. It's like biology is the study of life. A Christology is the study of Christ. These things reveal to us about who Jesus is. 
In fact, the Bible itself is one long teaching about the person, nature, and role of Jesus. He appears on every page, it's been said, from Genesis 1 to Revelation 22, the first page to the last page. This whole book, the Bible, is about Jesus. But within the scriptures, you get what some might call encapsulated Christologies or or teachings about Jesus, some very specific teachings about him. Some examples that you might want to check out later today are, are John chapter 1 or 1 Timothy 3.16 or Hebrews chapters 1, 4, 8, and 10. And then the text that we're going to talk about today. Uh, today we're going to read through Colossians chapter 1 verses 15 through 20. Uh, I, I believe that this gives us a clear view of who Jesus is. And if, if we're going to have an anchor point back to who God's calling us to be, if we're, if we're going to be replanted but still hang on to the core truths and core values of our lives, we must start out with the one who is our cornerstone, Jesus himself. And this passage tells us all about who Jesus is. So I want to read it, and then we're going to break it down and pray for us as well. So let's read it first. Colossians 1, verses 15 through 20. This is what it says. Christ is the visible image of the invisible God. He existed before anything was created and is supreme over all creation. For through him, God created everything in the heavenly realms and on earth. He made the things we can see and the things we can't see such as thrones, kingdoms, rulers, and authorities in the unseen world. Everything was created through him and for him. He existed before anything else. He holds all creation together. Christ is also the head of the church, which is his body. He is the beginning, supreme over all who rise from the dead. So he is first in everything. For God, in all of his fullness was pleased to live in Christ. And through him, God reconciled everything to himself. He made peace with everything in heaven and on earth by means of Christ's blood on the cross. Let's pray. God, as we dive into uh, having a high view of Jesus and a high view of Scripture, I pray that you transform our hearts to have that view. God, that we will... Uh, build our lives on these core values, on your cornerstone, on Jesus. Because God, we ultimately want to be like him. We want to be just like him in this world so that other people can come get to, to, to come to get to know him so that they can be reconciled to you as well. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So what does it mean to have a high view of Jesus? Well, it, it means that we believe what the scriptures say about Jesus. So what does Colossians say? Let's break it down here. This is one of those uh, concise places, concentrated places in Scripture that says a lot. So I'm going to encourage you to take notes here as we break down this this passage. So the first thing that Colossians 1, 15 through 20 tells us is is that Christ is the visible image of the invisible God. That's verse 15. You see, Christ is the image of God in the sense that he is the exact likeness of God. Like the image of on a coin or the reflection in a mirror, Christ is the image of God in the sense that the nature and being of God, what God is like, is revealed in him. If you want to know who God is and what God is like, look at Jesus. Now the second thing that, that, this, that this passage tells us is that Christ is the firstborn in all of creation. And this, this truth denotes uh, both priority in time, and supremacy in rank. So Jesus, um, he is what we see. He is firstborn. He is Lord over all of creation because he made it. He, he, is, he is the primary place where we gaze upon. He, he, is, he is the one, both in stature and in rank, everything that came into being came into being through him. Now, this, like I said, includes what we see. It also includes what we don't see. Uh, whatever supernatural powers that may be, Christ is the one who made him, made them, and he is their Lord. 
Now, now, creation is also for Christ in the sense that He is the end in which all things exist, the goal towards whom all things are intended to move. That all things hold together in Christ means that He is both the unifying principle and the personal sustainer of all of creation. The world keeps spinning because Christ is Lord. The world keeps going because Christ is Lord. So number three, the first two, visible image of the invisible God. Second one is firstborn of all creation. Number three, he is the head of the church. That's verse 18. Now to be the head of the church means that he is sovereign. He is over it. You see, Christ is the source of the church's life. Christ, as the head of the church, is its chief, its leader. He's the one who governs it and and leads it and guides it. Christ alone, Christ and no other, is the head of the church. Number four, Christ is the firstborn from the dead. You see, Christ was the first to come from from the dead into true resurrection. He's never going to die again. He has true life forever. And because of this, Jesus resurrected others as well. Now, he did this in his earthly ministry, but they all died again. But Jesus, through his resurrection, is alive forevermore. And because he was the firstborn from the dead, he possesses in himself resurrection, power over death. So that whoever follows after him, we get to experience that same resurrection power. So number five, God, he is fully God. That's verse 19. This means that nothing of deity is lacking in Christ. He is fully God. He is not subset or less than God. He, he is fully God, 100% God. God in all of his fullness was pleased to live in Christ. And number six, the last thing we're going to talk about. Jesus is the reconciler, peacemaker, and the sacrifice. That's verse 20. You see, God willed to, uh, God wanted, desired, He willed reconciliation of all things to Himself through Jesus. He desired that. God wants to be in relationship with you. He wants the division of sin to be done away with. And so He did something about it. You see, reconcile, that word reconcile means to change from enemies to children to declare peace between us, to declare that that division is no more. You see, God wanted to do something about it, so he sent Jesus so that we could have a unifying relationship between us and the Father. And that was all done through exactly what, what Paul writes here in the end of verse 20, by the means of Christ's blood on the cross. So those six things capture what it means to have a high view of Jesus his role, his person, and his nature. So, so why does it matter that we have a high view of Jesus? Uh, so if we have a high view, what, what, so what? Well, if you don't believe uh, these things, then, then, then for you, Jesus is less than what the Scriptures teach that he is. I'm going to say that again. If you don't believe these things, then the, then the Jesus that you believe is not the Jesus that Scriptures teach. If you don't believe that Jesus reveals God to us as God's visible image, then that means that for you, God remains shrouded in mystery. And you better be able to figure out God on your own at that point. That's that's a challenge I don't think I could do. I don't think any of us could do. If you don't believe that Jesus has all authority over creation, powers, and being, well, well then you, you begin to believe that powers in the hands of creatures themselves, both supernatural and natural, and they'll be able to do whatever they want. If you don't believe that Jesus has all authority in the church, then you leave it up to the church's leaders, and God help you with that. You see, the church is no different at that point than the Civitans or the Lions Club, doing a lot of good but nothing eternal. But with Christ as the head of the church, then things are different. If you don't believe that Jesus is the firstborn of the dead with power over death, then you believe that death is just the end. 
If you don't believe that Jesus is fully God, then he has no power to reconcile us to God. And thus we live with this constant division between us and God. You see, God doesn't desire us to live like that. You know, functionally, if you don't have these beliefs about Jesus, if you don't believe the things, the six things that we walked through a second ago, then you don't have faith. You have a philosophy. Like Buddhism or Islam or Hinduism. Um, and philosophies, you know, they, they claim that they're, they're easy to live by. And when you just have philosopher Jesus, when you just believe it's a philosophy and not a faith, then when philosopher Jesus asks you to die, that you might live, you begin to wonder, well, why should I follow after this? You see, a philosophy is not going to be an anchor point when we feel replanted. We will not become more whole just by intellectualism or, or just by believing which means living out the teachings and the ways of Jesus. You see, to have a high view of Christ, we must live the way He did. And to live the way He did, we must believe He is who He says He is. To live like Jesus, to live under His teachings, is not just to take it in intellectually, but it it means to believe He is who He says He is. The fullness of God in man. The reconciler. The Lord of all creation and all things. The one who has triumphed over death by resurrection. To believe who God is. To believe who Jesus says he is. Means that we have a true, vibrant faith. And not a philosophy. It means that we have a true anchor point to put our lives on. You see, here at the Orchard, we want to teach and equip our people to have a high view of Jesus. And this means that we must believe what the scriptures say about Jesus as well. So that means that we also have a high view of scripture. Then what does that mean? What does it mean to have a high view of scripture? Well, it means, just like we talked about with Jesus, it means that we believe what Jesus says about scripture. You see, it's tempting to use scripture to magnify and endorse the scripture. And there are plenty of other of scriptures that uh, point to the authority of scripture and the benefits of scripture. You see, the writer of the Psalms, specifically Psalm 19, says that the scriptures are perfect, trustworthy, right, clear, pure, and true. There's plenty of scriptures that do that. But there's also other material, secular material, that, that, that show a high standard of scripture as well. Um, that, in fact, Scripture has a higher credibility than most other historic, uh, historic books or, or sources. And the versions that we have today were written from eyewitnesses' accounts that were faithfully passed down for 2,000 years. Eyewitness accounts. Earliest dates being in the first century. Not hundreds of years after, but, but literally like 10, 20 years after, people wrote down these, these eyewitness accounts. You see, the New Testament has been preserved more than any ancient work. There are over 5,800 Greek manuscripts. You see, the runner-up for the New Testament is Homer's Iliad, which has less than 2,000 copies. After that is the works of Aristotle, Herodotus, Tacitus, excuse me, and, and others who are even more poorly represented with less than two handfuls for each person of of original Greek manuscripts. But for the New Testament, we have over 5,800. So we have a lot more evidence that Jesus said what he said than Aristotle said what he said. Those contribute to our high view of Scripture, no doubt. But here at the Orchard, our high view of Scripture is primarily based on Jesus' high view of Scripture. We have a high view of Scripture because Jesus had a high view of Scripture, and we believe what Jesus says about the Scripture. And Jesus makes a lot of comments on Scripture, uh, but we're going to go look at just one in Matthew chapter 5, verses 17 through 19. I want us to turn there. Here are four truths that Jesus says about the Scripture. Matthew 5, verses 17 through 19. I'm going to read it for you real quick. Don't misunderstand why I've come. 
I did not come to abolish the law of Moses or the writings of the prophet. No, I came to accomplish their purpose. I tell you the truth, until heaven and earth disappear, not even the smallest detail of God's law will disappear until its purpose is achieved. So if you ignore the least commandment and teach others to do the same, you will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But anyone who obeys God's laws and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. So here here are some four truths that, that we can glean from Jesus here. And I encourage you to take notes on this too. So number one, verse 17, Jesus endorses the Old Testament. He says he didn't come to do away with it, but to fulfill it, to confirm it, to, 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 uh, to, 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 to live it out faithfully. You see, Jesus fulfilling the law and prophets means that all the law and prophets point to him. And he is the fulfillment. He is the one that validates it. Number two, verse 18, Jesus says God's word is eternal. Heaven and earth will pass away, he says, but the truth and purpose of God's work and word will never pass away. You see, science will say that the earth is between four to six billion years old based on our uh, observations of uh, constellations and other stars. And, you know, astronomers predict that the sun will actually burn out in another 10 billion years. Now, I say all that to say because before our universe began, God's word existed. And when all of it ends, God's word will still exist. That's absurd to think about, isn't it? But that was Jesus' point. To zoom it in, I, I, love, uh, I love this quote. I've heard Eric George, our senior pastor, use it. A hundred years, all new people. In a hundred years from now, there will be all new people. But God's word will remain the same. So number three, the third thing that Jesus says is, is that God's word is intentional. It has purpose. That's in verse 18. And its purpose will be achieved. This Bible, this book, is not just a book of sayings. It is the word of God that is active and alive and working in our lives, in our world, to accomplish temporal and eternal purposes in our lives. So what is that purpose? Well, Paul writes to his young assistant, Timothy, he says this, he says, From infancy, you have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Jesus. All Scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. You see, the Scriptures lead us to Jesus, who saves us. They teach they rebuke, they correct, they train, and they equip us to do God's work. Now, the fourth thing, the final thing that Jesus says about God's Word is that it is to be a priority for the people of God. You see, the difference uh, between the least and the greatest here in this passage that we read in Matthew 5 is according to the faithfulness in which one teaches the Scriptures. The Word of God should be faithfully kept and faithfully taught by the people of God. We should hold fast to it as another anchor point in our lives. If we look at the life of Jesus and, and how he lived, he was always clarifying how God's word was to be taught and was to be kept because it had been mistaught and miskept during his time. You see, uh, Jesus' words, last words in Matthew's gospel is this. He says, go make disciples of all nations, baptizing them and teaching them to obey all the commandments I've given you. Teach them the word of God is what Jesus is saying. Now, one last thing before we move on here as to, to why this matters is what parts of the New Testament that were written after Jesus had returned to heaven, what about those parts? Well, we don't have Jesus' comments on them, you might say. Well, Jesus promised his disciples that the Holy Spirit is going to teach them more, that he would guide them into all truth, and he would remind them of what Jesus had taught them and reveal to them the future. And as the New Testament writers wrote their words, they recognized that they, that they recognized the fulfillment of Jesus' promise. Not just with those first 12, but with all of the writers of the New Testament. They were convinced that the Holy Spirit empowered both their teaching and their writings. 
And, and the early church believed that the, er, that, the, that the canon is now closed because of that. Because the Holy Spirit moved in those original 12 and in the New Testament writers to, to, to produce more of God's Scripture. And now we have the 27 books of the New Testament. So, what does it mean for us to have a high view of Scripture? Well, it means that we believe what Jesus says about the Scripture. So, why does it matter? Why does it matter that we have a high view of Scripture? Well, one of the most important decisions that you will ever make in your life is this. Where will I find the truth? There's always a ton of people that are going to claim to have the truth. There's going to be opinion articles. There's going to be emotions that we feel. Motivations, power politics. Pick any subject from from what we call uh, big to small, and there are going to be people who claim to have truth. There are going to be people who claim to have truth about abortion or sexuality or the death penalty, racism, terrorism, immigration, integrity, character, employment, leadership, and the list could go on. Ethics. And all all kinds of people who claim to have the truth about all these things. And the question you have to ask, are you going to find the way forward in truth through somebody else's opinions, how you feel about the subject, by by what your motivations that drive you, or by what power that you can ascertain? Or are you going to find the truth in the unchanging, eternal, purposeful Word of God? You see, this book, this, this Bible, it leads us into all truth. Now, that doesn't mean I'm always going to like what it says. I, believe me, I don't like always what it says. I may not always want to do what it says. But it is always true. So why is it important for us to have a high view of Scripture? Because when we, when we, do, uh, when we do have a high view of Scripture, we are saying that all, out of all the other voices... This voice right here, this book, this is the only voice I'm going to follow. This voice is the loudest and most authoritative in my life. And if it's not, well, it really doesn't matter which voice I follow because every other voice is going to lead me into disruption and chaos. You see, here at the Orchard, we have a high view of Scripture. We believe what Jesus said about the Scriptures. And he had a high view of Scripture. And so we do too. You see, Eric talked about last week uh, resolutions or renovations or, or re- these, these new things that we commit to in, during a new year. Well, a new year can feel a lot like replanting too. Like it can feel like a fresh start. Well, during this time of replanting, I want to ask you this question. Will you commit to build your life on the core values that we're going to talk about over this next series? Will you commit to having a high view of Christ and a high view of Scripture? If you want to explore more what that looks like, please reach out to one of our pastors. We'd love to partner with you and to have those conversations. And we welcome all kinds of conversations, questions, doubts, of affirmations. We would love to talk with you, to sit and chat. If you need accountability, if you want to start reading the Word more, the, the, the Bible more, and if you need accountability to that commitment, I invite you to join a community group this next, this, this, during this time. If you want to know more about the Bible, join the collective. That's our discipleship class where we walk through the entirety of Scripture. The main takeaway I, have, I want you to have from this is, 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 this, is this right here. You're not alone. You're not alone in figuring out your place in this thing called life. Let us help you. Because we're all replanting in our hearts this year. Let's pray. God, as we are in this replanting season, it it can be easy to listen to all different kinds of voices. People who are shouting on TV or through the radio or podcasts or maybe shouting at our own dinner table about what we should believe and how we should believe it. 
But God, the only truth that we're going to commit to, that we're going to hold on to, are the, are the words that are written in this book. Because these words are eternal. They're purposeful. And they're about the one who we build our life on, Jesus the Christ. So God, would you move in our hearts to commit to that even more this year? To give our lives to it completely. To having a high view of Jesus and a high view of Scripture. To you, our Father, in the name of Jesus and by the power of your Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen. Come to our time of response, and as always, you respond however you see fit. But I want to ask you to, to respond by reaching out, to leave a comment on this video, to, to shoot us an email at, uh, at, at our, our social media pages. Uh, we'd love to connect with you. Uh, we want to walk with you during this new year and during the, every other year because we believe God is going to do something amazing in and through you, and we'd love to help you out in it. So will you respond however you see fit? Hey, we now come to the time of our offering. As always, the offering is intended for those that call this place their home. If you're a guest with us today, we ask that you would not give unless you feel called to. Uh, we hope that you simply receive something from hanging out with us. We're always grateful. If this is your home, it's a chance for you to give, and we can always give in response to the God who's given us all things. Multiple ways to give that you can find on the screen. Uh, let's go ahead and pray for our offering at this time. Holy Spirit, we thank you for this opportunity of a new year, uh, an opportunity to replant, to get to know what you are calling us to be about. And in light of that vision, God, we want to give our lives, time, talent, money, resources, anything that we have back to you in such a way that, Lord, not only would you replant something in us, you may actually plant something in somebody else as well, Lord, that they, their lives would be continue to be growing deeper in Jesus Christ and branching out. We want to see your kingdom to continue to multiply in and through our area and across the globe. So use this offering today. We thank you for the opportunity to respond. In your name we pray. Amen. Hey, just a couple things for you to know about before you head out today. Starting next Sunday, January the 9th, uh, we're going to be back in person worship for two services at 9 and 11. You can also always join us online at 9 a.m. As well as if you're uh, a man in our church or you're connected to other people, you might want to invite them to our Orchard Men's Retreat. Uh, this is an event that happens for our whole family, all five campuses. Our guys get together at Camp Lake Stevens. That event is happening on January 21st and 22nd, Friday and Saturday. Two options you're going to learn about. You can stay on Friday night, but you don't have to. Or you can be there all day Saturday on January the 22nd. Look for registration soon. But if you're a guy in our church or connected, you've got friends, we would love for them to join us at that event. It's going to be a blast. Friends, we hope you have a great week. We hope this is a week that you continue to, as we've been talked about today, have a high view of Jesus and a high view of Scripture. Run towards those things. We'll see you soon. Thanks.